when we were inventing a cross, we were trying to figure out a way to do it differently. And the way we do it differently is by adding this third party, the relayer, that actually just fills the user very quickly with their own money. So quickly that it actually like emulates atomicity. It's almost like this is an atomic fill for the user. And the reason why this is so quick is because this relayer takes on that risk themselves. A user gets a fast fill and then the relayer has to wait to get paid back. This relayer has to make a loan for let's say an hour which seems like it could be costly, it turns out it's not that costly. At a 10% annualized interest rate, the cost of loaning funds for an hour works out to about a tenth of a basis point. And we're actually able to more than make up those costs by doing fund gas optimizations everywhere. This podcast series is presented by Archetype. Archetype is an early stage venture capital fund focused on backing crypto entrepreneurs who are working to accelerate the decentralized future. We lead investments in C-stage companies and are always open to speaking with crypto native founders. For more information on our team and portfolio, go to archetype.fund. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Archibite. Every other week on Archibite, we have on some of the smartest builders and founders in the crypto industry to tell us what's top of mind for them. Today, we are joined by Hart Lamber, who is the CEO and co-founder of Risk Labs. Risk Labs is most known for launching the UMA protocol as well as the ACROSS protocol. We also have a special guest today along with Hart, Nick Pai, who joined Risk Labs in 2020 and was an early engineer for UMA protocol and now a tech lead at ACROSS. He is also a research partner with me at Archetype, and we are very lucky to have his perspective within the firm. Now, without further ado, today's episode is about all things bridges, L2s, interop, from the taxonomy to the design choices to Nick and Hart's vision of the interop world. So welcome to the show, Nick and Hart. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. It's going to be fun. It's going to be very fun. It's going to be very nerdy, but very fun. <laughs> now, to, to kick us off, actually, I'm going to turn this first question over to Nick. Give us a very high-level brief overview of the bridging architecture taxonomy to start. Yeah, so I will set the stage and I'll describe the bridging problem briefly. And then I want to propose a framework for thinking about the solutions to this problem and then hand it over to Hart. So today, in 2023, blockchains are definitively multi-chain. The multi-chain future that we've all been talking about has arrived at this point. Many of these chains are isolated from each other. And those that are connected are either connected insecurely or securely, but slowly. So there's this new set of applications that define the interoperability industry that try to service users who want to transfer value and information quickly, securely, and permissionlessly. This is a really hard problem, as we've seen. The first bit about transferring information quickly is really hard because you can't really be confident about the state on the origin chain before you send it to the destination until the origin chain information has finalized. And usually finality can take several hours to several days. And transferring messages securely is also really hard because you need to make sure that the message that the user wants to transfer from one chain to another is not subject to censorship by a central party. In other words, the sender should always be able to fast forward their own message to the destination. And I think this presents a really hard UX problem in that it's actually a UX sensation, I view it as, in that sending a transaction of one chain to another feels magical. And it's very scary to see your transaction occur on one chain and then have to wait for it to appear on the other chain. Somewhere there ideally should be a trace of transactions from the origin to the destination such that the user can always feel secure that they can recover their message or revert it if something happens. And if this trace of transactions from the origin chain to the destination ever disappears, it feels scary and there's probably a trusted actor somewhere. So what Hard and I work on is something called a fast bridge. And fast bridges are essentially risk transfers to users. Fast bridges introduce a third party called a relayer or a filler who takes on the risk of finality on the origin chain and forwards messages really quickly to the user on the destination chain. So this relayer is taking on all this risk and the user is going to pay them for the privilege of transferring their message across. And so the whole challenge of bridges is determining whether this relayer acted correctly and determining whether to pay them a reward. And I think there are roughly four categories, and I'll just describe them at a very high level and we can get into details. But I think the four categories are asset type. So what kind of message is being transferred? Is it a token or just an arbitrary message? Settlement. 
how does the bridge actually refund or reward relayers? Is this done individually or in batch settlements? Validation. So how does the bridge validate that the bridge was transferred correctly? So optimistically, validity proofs, proof of authority. And finally, for token bridges, which are a subset of bridges that Hard and I really care about, where does liquidity come from on the destination chain? So is it held passively on chain or is it brought on chain just in time from market makers? So I think that's how I view the four categories. I'm kind of curious if Hart has a uh, different framework for that. Yeah, I mean, like Nick, you and I work together, so we probably agree a lot, <laughs> and I do. I think what I'd emphasize and add to your analysis here is just that most bridges follow this paradigm that they aren't this intense base bridging architecture that we we work on at Cross. So maybe to describe like the other bridges, it's basically deposit asset on origin chain, and then like something happens, some magic middle thing happens where a message is sent from origin to destination, and then funds are released on destination chain. And like you said, there's problems here where that something magic in the middle happening, if you're sending a message, it's costly, like even just gas costs, or it's insecure, or it takes time. So when we were kind of inventing across, we were trying to figure out a way to do it differently, is what I'd add to your analysis here. And the way we do it differently is, like you said, by adding this third party, the relayer, that actually just fills the user with their own funds, with their own money, and fills them very quickly with their own money, so quickly that it actually like emulates atomicity. It's almost like this is an atomic fill for the user. And again, the reason why this is so quick and fast is because this relayer takes on that risk themselves. And then what happens is, okay, user gets a fast fill, and then the relayer sits there and has to wait to get paid back. And the point that is interesting here, so we have a trade-off in this design versus the other set of designs. This relayer has to make a loan. They're effectively loaning funds for, let's say, an hour. But here's the brilliant thing, right? At a 10% annualized interest rate, the cost of loaning funds for an hour works out to about a tenth of a basis point. It's like a really teeny tiny number. And what we realized is that you can have this fast, great user experience because of this like very short-term loan. It doesn't really cost much. And it turns out that tenth of a basis point cost can be saved by doing intelligent things, which we do with the Across Protocol, to like save gas in other ways. And so we kind of have this cool trade-off where this relayer, by lending money, which seems like it could be costly, it turns out it's not that costly. And we're actually able to more than make up those costs by doing fund gas optimizations everywhere. So that's like the only other point that I've been harping on recently on how that works. And I find it cool. Well, I mean, we all love capital efficiency. So that is that is cool. Let me ask maybe more like digging into the design specifically, the design choices. So Aside from exchanges, I think bridges probably make up some of the biggest hacks in our industry. And if you just kind of read, you know, top whatever 10, 20 hacks, like there's a big portion of it that are like from bridges getting hacked. And I do think it's important to maybe delineate between like, you know, what are the types of bridges that get hacked or like historically? And then with what you guys are working on, and I do think through like, you know, design architecture for bridges, is there something as a truly safe bridge design? So Nick, I'll, I'll take a first pass and then you can add or critique. So I'd make two points here. One point is this, uh, many of the bridge hacks are what we call lock and mint bridge designs, where you go and you deposit a native asset on the origin chain. So let's just say it's ETH. I deposit ETH on Ethereum, and then I want to bridge a representation of ETH to a destination chain. Like, let's just take Solana. I want to bridge it to Solana. And Solana has no native ETH, so I have a wrapped version of ETH. I have my bridges version of ETH on Solana. And again, in this design, we still have the deposit, and then like magic in the middle happens to send a message to Solana, and then Solana like releases the wrapped ETH. And this lock and mint design is super scary because it means that I'm sitting there with my money, my wrapped ETH on Solana, But if that bridge architecture ever fails, there's this huge honeypot of money locked on the origin chain that can get drained. And some of the biggest hacks like Wormhole and and Nomad, like this is basically what happened. 
So one source of bridge risk is this lock and mint design, which I don't want to speak for Nick, but I know he agrees we don't like this. So we don't like fake versions of tokens. We only want to deal with canonical versions. So brings me to my second point. In many chains, there is a quote-unquote canonical way of sending messages or of bridging tokens. So like Arbitrum and Optimism, as examples, have canonical bridges that are close. They're not, it's not almost always the same, but they're close to the same. Trusting the canonical bridge is basically like trusting the chain itself. There's like little technical nuance in here, which uh, is worth exploring, but not right here. But basically, if you're using the canonical bridges, they're essentially as trustworthy as Arbitrum or Optimism themselves. And so the answer to your question is, I think if you are only using canonical bridges, then you can have safe bridging. And you're only using canonical representations of tokens, you can have safe bridging. The problem, right, is that those canonical bridges are slow and expensive. And like I'd argue that's a good thing. The reason why they're slow and expensive is because they're super secure. And we like want that. That's like our primary thing. So the canonical bridges are slow and expensive, but that's where like a cross fits in, where we layer on this intent-based bridging architecture, where we have these relayers that do these fast fills with their own money. And then they effectively rebalance themselves using only the canonical bridges. And so we've, again, figured out this sort of shortcut where we have this fast network of relayers providing liquidity on top of the slow and secure canonical bridging network. And I think, you know, I mean, look, I'm biased. This is our product. But I think that this is the right set of trade-offs in this design. What do you think, Nick? Yeah. I'd love to add to that. I think there are even more categories where like you can gain security and bridges. And I definitely think the type of asset or the type of canonical bridges you're built on top of is probably the most important factor. So back to the the categories I mentioned earlier, asset type, where liquidity comes from, settlement and validation. Like asset type is probably the most important. You if you deal with just canonical assets and canonical bridges, you're as safe as you can be with bridges. Now, in terms of liquidity, there are roughly like two types of bridges in terms of where the liquidity comes from. So either the liquidity is kept on all the destinations, you kind of have these like passive pools of AMMs that give out the funds at bridge time, or you can have just-in-time liquidity where market makers bring liquidity on-chain in order to fulfill a deposit. We favor the second one. So if liquidity is coming from the relayer and the relayer has the choice of how they want to bring the liquidity on chain in order to fulfill a bridge, that just seems a lot safer than keeping funds on chain where you have potential honeypots on each of the different chains. It's much better to have as few of these passive pools of liquidity as possible and leave it up to the relayer to determine how to bring liquidity on chain. In terms of settlement, two ways that I think bridges determine whether a bridge transfer should be settled or not is individually. So every single order is individually settled or batched. So like over the past hour, there might have been a hundred different bridge transfers from across all the different end chains. Individual settlement would settle each of those orders individually and batch would do a whole batch of them once per hour. The security trade-off here is that if you were batch settling, there's usually only one transaction that kind of proposes what the batch of settlements are. So this reduces the the attack surface a bit. If there's a bug, you don't have a bug in a hundred different settlements, you just have a bug in that one batch settlement. And then in the last category, in terms of validation, how do you actually determine whether that settlement is valid or not? There's several mechanisms for this. There's optimistic, so someone proposes a batch settlement or a series of settlements, and then during some challenge period, someone can dispute on that set of settlements. Another alternative would be validity proof. So this would require some zero-knowledge technology and some contract on each chain that can know about consensus state on the different chains. I I would say this technology is a bit early right now and a bit more theoretical, although it will eventually come to market. Or proof of authority. You kind of just have a trusted actor saying, this is the state of things. Maybe it's a multi-state, maybe it's a single EOA. And they kind of determine whether the settlement was correct or not. So... Obviously, the proof of authority is the least secure, and that has led to some hacks where some of the bridge hacks were not actually like contract bugs. They were just someone on the multi-sig who validates settlements. Some of their keys were compromised. 
I believe the safest currently would be optimistic validation because optimistic validation means that most of the validation logic is moved off chain and then different off chain actors can run the same or slightly different code and try to challenge each other. But this means that the validation logic can be upgraded very quickly off chain. Eventually, I do think the safest will be validity proofs, but I just think that technology is a bit early right now. But in summary, there are many different ways to gain security with bridges. And I think that the narrative right now of bridges being dangerous is just that there have been many primitive bridges built with trade-offs that I think are trading off security in favor of speed and cost. I want to ask you, do you agree that in my mind, when I think about bridges, I kind of think of bridges as L2s. Is that a, is that a go on? Okay. Okay. Say more, Catherine. Okay. The reason, okay. So I want to get at the question of shared sequencers and the trade offs. And people talk about shared sequencers in the context of L2s, but in my mind, bridges are also L2s. And so how do you guys think through the trade offs with decentralized versus centralized sequencers? Okay, if we go out like Zoom way out, we have these different blockchains. And if you're within your own blockchain, it's a happy little universe where you're just doing your like state transitions within your blockchain and everything is happy and good. Everything gets complicated when you try to tie these blockchains together. And so I think, Catherine, the way I very much agree with your statement that bridges are L2s is like, most L2s, and this is now made blurry by the concept of maybe like a sovereign roll-up, but like, let's not go there for a second. Most L2s try to anchor themselves to a chain as their base source of security. So Optimism and, and Arbitrum, for example, they checkpoint their state into Ethereum mainnet periodically. And that basically means these two chains are tied in their own way. And you can think in a sense of that checkpoint as sort of like a very meta bridge transaction where we are bridging, we're creating a bridge, we're creating a link between the rollup and Ethereum mainnet in this case. And so in that sense, I do think that bridges are like very related, like you can tie these two concepts together. Again, this is like kind of where I think the across intense base bridging architecture is pretty interesting, where the bridge between optimism, for example, and Ethereum mainnet is slow. It just takes a while and those checkpoints only happen. It takes seven days, the way it's designed, seven days to prove that this checkpoint is right. So what we're really doing here is in a sense, a cross is not a bridge, maybe. Maybe that's the way to think about it, where there are these canonical bridges that are tying things. And then a cross is kind of like this system for relayers that kind of look like market makers to quickly do things between these two worlds such that the user has a good experience and then the third party actor the relayer and i'm abstracting this is like very uh, generalized but the third party relayer is the one that's then using the canonical official bridge to rebalance or to kind of validate that things happened so I'm now ranting, but like, imagine you have two pools, two chains, A and B, and they're their own happy universe, and they're tied together with this slow but secure mechanism. And instead, you want to offer another layer, this like fast bridge layer that is effectively aggregating user orders, limit orders or intents, whatever you want to call them. And this third party is providing a convenience function of letting the user quickly go between these two chains while we ultimately go back and secure them on the default bridge. Yeah, it's almost like the sequencer's main role is to periodically bring batches of transactions on chain, just publishing like this is a set of transactions and allow people to challenge them. But sequencers are concerned usually with generalized transactions. So within those transactions, some of them could be like message transfers. Some could be more specifically ERC-20 transfers. It's almost like bridges service specifically the ERC-20 transfers that happened somewhere. And they publish them periodically on chain. And they allow relayers to kind of cherry pick ERC-20 transfers that happened on some L2. And they allow a place for the relayer to say, these transactions happened on the L2. I'm going to put money behind it, and I'm going to front the user some money on this other chain. 
and I'm going to request repayment from the bridge. So I guess in, in the general sense, like sequencers and bridges are both concerned with making statements about what happened off the chain, like off whatever origin chain we're using as our perspective. And then bridges are specifically dealing with like ERC-20 transfers. You know, we care about speed, we care about capital efficiency, maybe we care about decentralization, and that's why we talk about shared sequencers. But does that ironically affect speed? Is the denominator of like slow speed basically the slowest shared sequencer? Well, I think there's a lot of still misconceptions here. Like shared sequencers can get confused with decentralized sequencers too. So instead of running your sequencer in a centralized way, you want to trust some protocol to run your sequencer. Okay, so you decentralize it. That's great. The shared sequencer has this promise of sort of composability between rollups, but that's like not totally true. You can't atomically execute things between rollups. You can atomically include them, but you can say, hey, here's a set of transactions I want to do on chain A, and here's a set of transactions I want to do on chain B. And a shared sequencer could atomically send those sets of transactions to both chains at effectively the same time. But it cannot guarantee that those sets of transactions both execute and don't revert. So this is me being a little nuanced on so, sort of some of the over promises that shared sequencers have today. Could that get solved in the future? Maybe. I'm actually kind of doubtful. But my bigger point here is like shared sequencers don't solve our interop problems because we can't do atomic execution. They might solve for decreasing the latency between reading between different layer twos. I think that there are some very like real designs on how to do that. And what that would mean in, in our case is there would still be a need for a fast bridge if you want to do things very quickly between layer twos. And I think that that is a very promising direction. So I'm actually really bullish on a lot of the shared sequencer stuff in terms of it supporting a cross, where a cross can do right now sub one second L2 to L2 transactions, but the relayer will be able to get paid back more quickly and will have increased capital efficiency if the relayer can get paid back say, within a few minutes, that just makes the cost of the relayer convenience that much lower. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And shared sequencers also consolidate the trust amongst different chains. So one of the problems with fast bridges today is if you're trying to bridge from, say, let's say Polygon to Optimism, they have very different rules about finality. So a transaction might take hours to be included on Polygon, it might take days to be included on Optimism. And as a relayer who's bridging transactions between the two, you, you need to be aware of how finality works on both of them because you can't risk a transaction on the origin chain from either of these chains reverting. And similarly, on the destination chain, you kind of you, you also have to be aware of finality in terms of when you can get your funds back. So if you were instead bridging transactions between two chains that share the sequencer, it's just a bit easier as a relayer. Maybe this doesn't reduce complexity in your code, but it reduces complexity in your operational like cost in terms of thinking and, and dealing with different chains. So it probably will be easier to relay between bridges with shared sequencers. And we see that today, actually, with optimism and base. I don't know if they actually specifically share a sequencer, but they have similar finality mechanisms. What about, like, this is actually one of your questions, Nick. What do you think the role of aggregators is within the bridging space? Yeah, I'll start that. From Macross's perspective, we've kind of seen aggregators act as the tip of the spear in terms of being the first application that a lot of users use to bridge transactions between chains. And aggregators have a lot of leverage within the bridging space because they can focus a lot of efforts on UX and they will usually route orders to the bridges that are the cheapest and the fastest to deliver. And the whole bridging UI, if it exists, gets abstracted from the user in, in many cases. So I think aggregators are very important and they pressure bridges to compete on so far speed, cost, and security. Oh, uh, Nick, I'm not, not sure this is contrarian to what you're saying because obviously like aggregators are something across is really embraced and we really enjoy working with them because they're a pretty cool showcase for our product where right now in aggregators across usually shows up as the cheapest and fastest and often by a large margin. So they're like a very cool way to showcase how our approach to interop works. But I think I'll 
if I like project out into the future, I see there being this structure in this intense space bridging architecture. So I'm super bullish that this type of intense space bridging architecture is the future of where stuff is going. And I look at it now, there being a world of three layers here. There's user order generation. So like an RFQ or aggregator sits at the top layer generating these orders. There's this middle layer of relayers or solvers or searchers or whatever you want to call them that are fast filling these users with their own capital. And then the bottom layer is like the settlement layer where those user intents are getting settled. User funds are basically getting escrowed until we verify that the middle layer did its job. And so projecting this out, I look at aggregators as a source of order flow for this intent-based bridging architecture, much in the same way that the across front end, across that TO, for example, is a source of order flow in the same way that like Uniswap X would be a source of order flow or one inch fusion or cow swap. And so we have this world where orders are being generated by users and these limit orders are what people call intents and they could be cross chain. And then we have this hyper competitive solver relayer ecosystem to fill them. And then you have like settlement layers at the bottom. And I actually think in this architecture, the across fast bridge, you can actually reimagine it as this settlement layer that is supporting order flow no matter where it comes from, including coming from aggregators. We're supporting order flow to help settle these fast bridge transactions. Yeah, so a bridge just offers, I guess, fundamentally a validation mechanism for settlements, settlements of transfers between different chains. And then the bridge can be agnostic about how those transfers actually get signaled. They could be signaled from aggregators. They could be signaled from across chain decks like Uniswap X. They could come directly from like the across front end right now or any bridge front ends. But yeah, I do, I do think the way the kind of seems the interoperability industry is moving is that bridges are going to move more towards the settlement layer. Okay. Last question. Last question. And this is like bridges, but more like generally L2s. If you had to pick one metric for success for L2, what would it be? And the reason why I'm asking this is because we're recording this on November 22nd, 2023. And yesterday I saw an announcement of like a really hot, (laughs) I guess, like L2 that everyone's talking about called Blast, I think. And it's like super controversial. And if I were to just take that perspective, it would seem like a metric for success would be like ETH deposited. And that's like, I think a lot of people had issues with like how they were achieving that. And so it got me thinking sort of like, if you were thinking through designing an L2, like what is your metric for success? I mean, I think it's, for me, it's transaction fees. Like what are people paying to use your L2? It's kind of interesting because the whole point of an L2 is you want to make really low transaction fees. But I mean, in aggregate, what is the total amount of revenue that your network is generating? Because that's literally what people are paying for. So TVL and all that matters. But I think you want people paying to use the service. And the more people are paying to use the service in aggregate, the more service you're providing. Yeah, I think that's really good. I think like volume and TVL, TVL especially is a bit overrated. At the end of the day, it does come down to fees. Although I guess you could think about volume and TVL as potential future fees. But I think it it is hard to increase fees over time. Yep, super fair, super fair. Where can people go and follow uh, the work that you guys do at Across? So you can go check out our website at across.to, across.to. And on Twitter, it's at Across Protocol. For me personally, I'm at Hal2001, and I'm trying to write increasingly spicy takes on the future of Interop. So happy to uh, happy to entertain you there. Uh, what about you, Nick? I am on Twitter at Mountain Water Pie. Um, my last name is P-A-I. And also Hart's Twitter is really good and you should read it. And it is really spicy, but I think it really opens up. It should open up your mind about thinking about L2s. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, plus one on the on the spicier takes coming from Hart lately. Um, <laughs> good to see it. All right, guys, thanks for taking the time today. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Hart. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Archibite, presented by Archetype. We release new episodes every other Wednesday, so go catch up on any you've missed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Make sure to also follow us at Archetype VC on both Twitter and YouTube, and rate our show when you get a chance. For more information on the Archetype team and portfolio, go visit our website at archetype.fund. 